that. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. One sec. Okay, so we, we're now recording. Um, and <clears throat> Sri Ram, thank you so much for joining us today. This is super exciting. Uh, I guess this is our our second uh, uh, kind of very serious PL talk from a, a PL professor after having Matias, although we've certainly had PL uh, students in the past. Um, and uh, uh, I think there's a lot of excitement about this talk. So I'm gonna hand the uh, stage over to you. Thank you so much for joining us and um, uh, looking forward to learning about uh, data centricity. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great, uh, it's wonderful to hang out with you folks. Um, it's not really much of a PL talk, but it'll have some opinions about PL-ish things as you'll see. So here's the idea. Um, you know, let's start by a quick analysis of what collegiate CS1 is. And some of you might feel a little uh, seen in this slide and you might feel a little upset about it. I apologize if that's the case, but I still think this is a pretty accurate state of the world. So we all know what goes in the CS1 course, right? You start with numbers and strings, you use some variables, assignments, conditionals, loops. You argue a little bit about what kinds of loops you should have, for loops versus while loops, functions, arrays, and maybe you think functions are a little more advanced. You do arrays before functions because what do you loop over otherwise, et cetera. Right. So it's sort of been the story of CS1 kind of unchanged since like the 1970s, right? Since like Niklas Wirt uh, roamed the land kind of thing. Okay. Um, and in fact, if you look at uh, the kind of sort of data structures we've used in, in CS1, uh, you'll see again a certain similarity there too, where, uh, you know, we start off with, um, where, where, where are my slides? Yeah. So we start off with, uh, uh, you know, in the 70s, you see, like, you know, we had Pascal and we had arrays in Pascal. Uh, and then we made progress in the 80s. We started moving from Pascal to C. Um, and then we made more progress in the 90s. We moved from C to C++. Uh, and then, you know, eventually we got to Java uh, and we moved up to array lists. And finally, we're in the land of Python, where finally we have associative arrays instead. Right. So real progress in computer science education. Um, and in the meanwhile, if you look at the context in which the CS1 course lives, uh, there's a whole bunch of forces that are sort of attacking this uh, this uh, this uh, cell from the outside. Right. You've got uh, you know, this phrase that people like to use, you know, uh, not to Edward Teller, the unreasonable effectiveness of data. And how does that play into CS1? Um, and then some people are like, oh, I know CS1 is going to teach them some web programming. But then, you know, if you've ever played with like these low code, no code systems, they do an amazing amount of stuff for very very little, you know, for no programming at all. So what does that do to your CS1? Or of course, you know, we're going to have to talk about ChatGPT, but um, we're not going to talk about ChatGPT for the next like 20 minutes at least. And if anybody mentions ChatGPT, since I'm now an owner of the call, I will banish you. I'll just like put you back in the waiting room and leave you there for a non-deterministic amount of time. And then you can like, you know, rule your choices in life. Okay. So we won't talk about that for the next 20 minutes or so. And uh, finally, there's so many other constraints as well. You know, we need to talk about how computing applies to so many different areas. We need to to talk about the need for diverse student populations. We need to talk about negative social impacts. How does all this play into the standard narrative of we're going to teach loops in Python, right? It's a pretty bad story. Okay. Now, of course, different people are trying different things. So I'm not, you know, this is not meant to be like a universal statement here, but I think it's not an inaccurate representation of the way a lot of CS courses have fared over the years. So CS1 is kind of under threat. And there are lots of other things happening. If you go to uh, many universities, you'll see like there's this new major curricular trend of data science, right? Now, of course, using the word new in this context is a little funny because uh, uh, what, like Harvard Business Review declared data science the sexiest job of the year in like 2010. So of course it makes sense that universities are finally catching on in about 2020. Um, but you know, so what does this mean? What does this trend mean? Well, there's lots of things happening, right? There are courses, there are boot camps, there are even entire degrees. There are now master's degrees and bachelor's degrees and colleges and schools and all kinds of things being announced in data science. Right. And data science is also kind of interesting because it's not just like pure CS, right? If you just take CS and just rebrand it, that doesn't work. It's really this interesting combination of programming and visualization and statistics all playing together in interesting ways. So 
One question we can ask is from the perspective of a traditional computer science curriculum, as you know, I am after all in a computer, I, I'm like the most boring creature, right? I'm a computer science professor in a computer science department. I am not a school of anything. We are not any of those other things. So how should we view this? Of course, I also wear, as some of you know, a middle school and high school computing hat, and that's completely different. But as a professor, you know, how do I view this? Well, you know, there's, of course, we know what the correct answer is, right? Like, I mean, if you look at these data science courses, like they don't even teach the basics. Oh my God, they're so bad, right? They're just like, let's hack something together till we produce a graph. You know, the hello world is probably like some, I don't know, some graph or some linear regression or something like that. And once they have that, they declare victory and go home. And then somebody else has to pick up the spoils and clean up the mess that they created. That's pretty bad. Um, you know, realistically, for a lot of places, a threat to our degree program. So, you know, we've gotten high on our supply of enrollment, and now we've got to, like, deal with that. Um, I think there's a much better response to all of this. Uh, it's a little bit, you know, that many of you are PhD students. In fact, I think almost all of you are graduate students, right? So I have this piece of advice that I give my students and myself, which is, you know, when a paper gets rejected, um, just, you know, you open the file, open the message, you see the decision, it says rejection, and then you wait for a week and then you read your reviews, right? Because what you'll discover in that week is that the reviews have magically gotten a whole lot better, right? Because when you first get the rejection, you're like, no, I mean, I spent three months on this paper and these people are idiots and they don't know anything. And then a week later, after the pain of rejection has gotten, over, you know, washed over you and got, you know, sort of subsided from your system, you start to say, like, you know, there's a point that maybe that, I mean, of course, they're still idiots, but, you know, they may have a point there, right? So, so in fact, like, you know, my view is when I get a rejection, it's always like a learning opportunity. There's no point getting upset at reviewers. Like if, you know, if you say they didn't understand, it means like you didn't teach, right? That's what it means. You wrote a bad paper, right? So similarly, I view these kinds of curricular challenges. Oh, uh, yeah. I'll get you. Is that a question or? Yeah. Uh, usually the rebuttal period is like within the next three, four days. So how will you wait for seven days? Oh, yeah, yeah. But you don't get a decision in the rebuttal period, right? You just get an initial set of reviews. And so that's where you're full of hope. You're like, I shall show mm -hmm. them the wrongness of their ways. It's when the decision comes out, that's when the bad news comes, right? So, okay. yeah. So um, here's the way I look at data science, right? Data science is actually a valid criticism of co current computers, computing education. Um, the valid criticisms are manifold. Uh, we have a lot of curricula that do not actually engage our students. Uh, we have uh, curricula that do not in any meaningful way connect to society or to real world phenomena. Uh, you can't often do anything useful after most CS1 courses. Um, and computing is used everywhere and students don't go back prepared to do something in some other subject that they came from, right? If a sociology student comes and takes a computing course, when they go back at the end of a semester, of like loop programming, they can't actually do anything meaningful in sociology, right? They can't identify the computing there. They can't apply it there. It's pretty bad, okay? So these are all valid criticisms. And so I think it's a reasonable question to ask, like, what does it mean to reform computing education for the data era, right? So I'm going to start my critique by going back to the slide, right? It's like arrays, arrays, and more arrays, and yet more arrays, and oh, beautiful arrays now, right? And, and ask this question, like, okay, all right, so there's a reason I put this up. What was the point I was trying to make? Well, let's think about a typical programming assignment we might ask, I don't know, like week two or week three or something, right? You get a question like this, what is the average of this list, right? And everyone's like, oh, whatever, right? Students like, fine, whatever. I very vaguely remember what average is in some random list of numbers. Okay, so so of course what professors do, they're like, oh, I know, let's jazz this up a little bit. Let's say this is a list of ages. That's what it is, right? Like and students are like, ah, oh, boring. You're like, okay, fine. No, no, it's not just a list of ages. It's a list of singers' ages, right? And now it's like real data. And it's still like, yeah, kind of boring. Okay. Um, I'm going to take the same problem and I'm going to do something extraordinarily superficial. Okay. I'm going to recast this question by asking exactly the same question, except I'm going to show you the data like this. And I claim that this is a pretty transformative moment, right? I don't have to tell you that these are lists of singers' ages. In fact, you like you probably have all sorts of opinions of this data, right? That you didn't have when you just saw that list of numbers. 
I don't have to convince you that these are ages of singers because you know these are ages of singers. In fact, you might want to pick a fight with me and be like, actually, well, actually, you know, Shakira was born on such and such date. So depending on how you want to compute this, et cetera, et cetera, you'd be like, well, you know, there's a more famous song about this person. Suddenly we're having a conversation about something. Right now, it might be a slightly distracting conversation at some points, but it's a conversation you're engaged in because you don't actually care about ages, but you care about the collection of data that we're looking at. Right. But it's literally the same question still. Right. Nothing has actually changed. And yet I would claim a lot has changed in this problem statement. Okay? Now, some of you are Northeastern students and you've been exposed to the, the Church of Matthias. So, of course, you know the correct response. Right. The correct response is but. But, see, the problem is a table is an arbitrarily large homogeneous collection of data, and each of those collect each of those data is, is a fixed number of heterogeneous data. This is a very complicated data structure, right? And if you look at this book called How to Design Programs, it actually, tables are a pretty advanced topic. You work through atomic data, then you get to structured data that's, you know, fixed and heterogeneous. Then you get to lists of atomics, which are recursive, and so they're homogeneous, but they're arbitrary, but they're still, you know, atomic. And then you get to a list of structured data, and that's what a table is, right? It's a pretty complicated. If you think about it from an axiomatic perspective, a table is a very complicated datum, right? So you eventually get to sort of table processing like things in HTTP, but it takes a while before you get there, right? You got to build up to it. Like you got to like work, you got to earn it in some sense, okay? All right. That sounds pretty bad, right? So I've told you we can take some of these problems and even trivially make them more interesting. I promise I'll get to more interesting things about tables in a moment, but trivially we can make them more interesting, except it's like, it's gonna take a while before we get there, okay? Um, one of my favorite papers is this very modest paper called Modeling as a Core Component of Structuring Data. Um, it's it's by a bunch of uh, people who you know work with, real data sets and work on data science education. And what they did was they tried to get a bunch of middle and high schoolers to wrestle with some data and just sketch out literally on paper the way they viewed the data, right? And the students all produce sketches kind of like this, right? And this is gonna sound familiar as a data type, right? They're tables. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm gonna quote a part of the abstract of the paper. There's a pit that's bold-faced, that's my emphasis, but I think it's really interesting. They say 79% of their data sheets successfully encoded the data. Even 62% of the middle school students were able to create a bound structure that could hold critical information from diagrams. So this isn't even data tables they were given. They were generating the tables from other data, right? And the thing that I find particularly interesting, a majority of these structures involved a hierarchy of cases rather than the flat case-by-case -case structure that were, you know, statistical software or for the matter like spreadsheets use, right? And you can see a little bit of that. If you look in the top right of that picture, you can see that the type, that first entry actually has two sub rows in it, right? So, Middle schoolers have no trouble understanding this concept, right? I mean, our software does, but middle schoolers have no trouble. So, so actually, table types are very basic primitive in our brain, okay? Um, there's another very cool thing in this paper, which is a picture from of a clay tablet from Ur. So this is about 2,000 years BCE. Right, and it's like one of the first table, one of the first tables, right? So we've had table data types around for a very long time, right? We have literally had tables on tablets, which is where the word comes from, right? So, so the 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 logical medium and the physical medium were once deeply connected, and now they're less connected. But I claim that we should just be thinking of tables as primitive data types. Okay, the other great thing is there are a ton of tables out there in the world. There's this very nice site called Data Commons that's uh, hosted by Google. Of course, this is maybe like a little bit of a like zero interest rate phenomenon. I don't know how long the site will stay up, but you know, nevertheless, it's a really great collection of data. It gives you all these like plots and explorers and whatnot, but you can also download the data and you can go and process the data yourself. And what does download mean? CSV, tables, right? Import your tables and off you go. Um, so as I mentioned, I've been working on this middle school curriculum for a long time now. It's called uh, Bootstrap. We're one of the largest middle school providers in the in the country. Uh, you know, Kathy Fisler, Emmanuel Schanzer, and a bunch of us have been working on this for about 15 years now. Um, one of the papers we wrote recently was we were looking at this data science curriculum, this middle school, high school data science curriculum. And what we do over there is we do something a little different from what I just mentioned. We don't give them all of data commons. 
right? A lot of our teachers are not qualified, like they're not computer scientists, they're not comfortable working with tabular data, you know, with, with data, with programming over tabular data and things like that. So we have to give them a fairly subscribed curriculum that they can actually understand and follow. So what we do is we get, and you know, the other thing is data always contain noise and they don't know how to curate the data. So we give them a small collection of curated data sets, right? So it's, it's you know, it's like 20, 30, 40 data sets, depending on which time of the year, which time, which year you look at. But the point is there's enough to get student interest, but not so much that we can't control a bunch of key variables in there. Right. So we want to make sure there's at least one quantitative thing, one qualitative thing, there's a meaningful correlation to compute, et cetera. Right. And what we found in this paper, we studied how students reacted to these data sets. And here's here's some quotes. There's a lot of text here, but I want to call out some important things. Right. How to choose students choose their data set. Forty two percent said there was something that they already knew something about. So they already had some vested interest in it. The other 40 percent said I didn't know much about it and I was curious. OK, so it's exactly like that singer data set that I showed you early on. Right. It's like. Either I know a lot about singers and I care about them, or I'm kind of intrigued about them and I'd like to learn more about them, right? And you can see also that some of these students say things like, I'm interested in the particular hobby or I'm interested in a particular field. Like these are middle school students or high school students thinking, I might want to go into medicine and hey, I can use this data science thing to start exploring the field of medicine somehow, right? Look at professional occupations, right? Overall, we concluded that not only is there a high degree of engagement, Equally importantly, if not more importantly, there's very low degrees of disengagement. And if you're a person who's ever taught CS1 and handed out like, let me give you a list of numbers and compute the average of it, I can assure you disengagement is extraordinarily high, right? And here, just the act of putting it in that table, making it feel like real data suddenly creates high degrees of engagement, okay? So that's an argument for how we should be thinking about redesigning curricula. Now let me make a few more technical points, okay? So, you know, here's an example of a datum, right? We might give to a person. I want you to observe from a technical perspective that there's something very interesting about tables. Tables have the following property. They are very rich in structure, but they are also already parsed. That is actually kind of a magical combination because there are a lot of things that are very rich in structure, like text, that come with a nightmare of parsing problems, right? In fact, if you give students textual data to start with, the first thing you have to teach them is probability theory because if they don't understand probability theory, no parsing of text makes any sense at all. And so you've solved, you, you've reduced it to a much harder problem basically, right? You have made a subroutine of a much harder problem to solve before you can solve the easier problem. On the other hand, you have data types like images and graphics that are very well parsed, right? Like we get a grid, it's a grid of pixels. We understand exactly what it is, but all the deep structure is missing. It's just a grid of pixels, right? And we're back to like, you know, running complicated algorithms, Voronoi diagrams, whatever, to find what the structure is inside that picture. Tables are kind of a sweet spot where they are both rich in structure and they are parsed. We can spend zero time parsing, we can get on with the processing, but there's enough structure that you can actually do interesting processing over it. It's not just like, you know, do an M by N matrix, you know, you have an M by N matrix of pixels and you just have to write two loops over it and good luck with that, right? So there's something very interesting, I think very rich and interesting about this as a primitive data type to start from, okay? Next thing is you can ask all sorts of questions that, you know, when you give students a day table of interesting data, here's the beautiful thing. They will generate the questions themselves. This is not a thing you often see in a CS1 class. If you give students a list of numbers, they're not likely to generate very many interesting questions. You give them that same list of numbers in the context of those, of those, um, uh, you know, like the music artists I showed you, they will automatically start asking questions from which continents are they from and so on, right? They will, in, the questions come out from the data. So you can start asking a bunch of questions. They will come, the problems come become more interesting. They're concrete. They're easy to envision. They're physically manipulable. You can actually take the physical tables. You can chop them out with the scissors. You can rearrange them. You can write on them. You can do augmentation. They lend themselves to working with structure. You can put them in a spreadsheet, right? More interestingly, they also lend themselves to problem decomposition and planning. Right? I have this table, I need to get to this answer. How do I get from here to here? Well, maybe we can do this. 
Maybe we can do that. You don't have to know programming to do that. You can just think in terms of high-level operations, right? And everybody can be part of that conversation. If you start your CS1 in Python, what's going to happen is it's going to be dominated by the kids who had Python in high school. If you start your CS1 not in Python, you think in terms of these operations, you think in terms of data, people who have looked at data will have interesting things to say. Oftentimes, it's the kids who haven't had high school CS because the high school students are immediately thinking, am I going to write a for loop or a while loop? The people who are just looking at the data are like, you know, here's what I notice. It makes me wonder the following thing, right? You get a much more inclusive, a much more vibrant classroom atmosphere. And you can think about decomposition and planning and so on without over committing to particular programming modes. Next thing, we can actually teach a whole bunch of different programming forms with this. So I'm gonna show you a few examples from Pirate. So, you know, you can do, uh, th this is now I'm gonna show you some Pirate syntax. This is your sort of classic, uh, you know, this looks like it would look like an R or Python or something like that, right? You have like a method and you put a Lambda inside that method. Uh, but in Pirate, we've also got special syntax. So we've got like a, well, you know, a query syntax for doing filtering and extension and so on. So that gets rid of all the Lambdas and the overhead of the Lambdas. And you get a little insight into what a language like SQL might look like. Right, but at the same time with named outputs and the ability to like manipulate outputs and so on. But you can also compose these things and you can write functions, you get methods and functions and query syntaxes and loops and all of these things working together very nicely, right? So you can also teach all of the programming concepts you wanted to teach before. And if you have a language like Pirate that's actually flexible, you can even teach it in multiple different ways, okay? Next. As some of you have probably noticed looking at this table, right? There's a weird column in there, right? And that's painful, but that's also how, what real data look like. So immediately you can start having conversations about things like data quality. What does it mean to normalize? What does it mean to cleanse? What happens if you get a table like this? Like what does that actually do in practice? Right. And what do you need to think about when you're processing real world data sets? Right. That is something that the CS courses have always ignored for the longest time. But for that sociology student is super important because if they're going to go off and compute some statistic on this and report it, they could have ended up computing garbage instead. Right. So so you can you can trigger all the right conversations. Another one. Right. Just again, with this data set, I've got this column of names. Right. Arguably one of the very best blog posts ever written is this one called Falsehood Programmers Believe About Names. If you haven't read it, stop the talk, go read the blog post. It's that good, okay? And if you have read it, you'll agree. It's like this phenomenal piece and there's now a whole bunch of like falsehoods programmers believe about time, falsehoods programmers believe about dates, falsehoods programmers believe about locations, blah, blah, blah. I've got a whole folder of falsehoods believe, programmers believe about uh, law stashed away somewhere, right? Um, I hand this out as one of about a dozen readings in my intro uh, course every fall. Students voluntarily come back and say, this was the most profound thing they got out of the course, right? Because it basically, no matter which culture you come from, you learn something about another culture by reading this article, right? So now we're getting to have this conversation. I mean, as in fact, I purposely seeded it to two data, data here, you know, Guy Lewis Steele, junior, right? His last name is not Steele Jr., but he is Guy Lewis Steele Jr. So where does his name go in a first name, last name system? Robbie is actually a, per, a professor uh, who's Indonesian and many Indonesians have only one legal name, right? So Robbie is just Robbie. What do you do with a blank last name? Most computers would crash. I actually don't have a last name. Krishnamurti is not my last name. It's my father's given name. I am K. Sriram in my in my culture's way of naming people. But when I applied to the US, I was like, you know, if I leave last name blank, computers will blow up. I need to put something in there, so I'll just stick something in there. Right. So, so, you know, so so there's this conversation we can have about data and reality and you know what is truth and what is representation? And we can have that with something as simple as a table like what's on the screen, right? But we can also have more interesting questions like what is getting collected? What are the inferences we can perform? What is the decision-making process? What, you know, 
what are what are the consequences of hoovering up all of these data? What can we compute? What can we learn? And what are the problems that it causes? And we don't have to imagine it. We don't have to have it in a completely hypothetical conversation. We can give students real data sets, have them play with it and see it for themselves, right? So I'm arguing that we have a completely different way, a completely different set of conversations about the about the materials and fabrics of computer science just by changing a data type. If we don't change the data type, these conversations are all like sort of completely superficial abstract in one year, out the other, right? In contrast, you give a student a data set and you say, go compute it, what do you notice? And they're like, whoa, that's not good, is it? Right? And all those points I made at the beginning of including broader families of students in these conversations, bringing them into computer science, talking about the social consequences and so on, instead of just being talk, we can make it reality, we can make them program it for themselves and see how it works. Okay. Now, of course, uh, you know, I'm going to, you're going to come away from this talk thinking, wow, Shurim has never heard of any of the data types, has he? It sounds a little troubling. So what I'm going to tell you is what we do next is what we do next is we say, well, let's think about trying to represent something like, you know, a uh, biological family tree, right? So there's some like male donor and some female donor. And how do we reference them in a table? This is, by the way, actual pirate syntax, the syntax in the language for pirate, for tables. Um, but, you know, what this person, Anna, seems to have a Susan and a Charlie. But how do we refer to Susan and Charlie? Well, we've got to. So now we're starting to talk about like indices and like uniqueness and so on. And this is a pretty crappy way to represent a family tree. Right. So this becomes the limitations of table become the point of departure to move away from tables and move to all the traditional computer science that we know and love. Right. So we start off with tables. We go pretty deep with tables. And then we say, well, we can use this as a motivation for all kinds of new data structures. And then there are other reasons also why you might not want to choose this data structure, the table, which is performance. So now we've opened the door to talking about things like performance, data representation choices. Do we want to store the table this way? Do we want to store the table that way? All these conversations come into the come in, right? So, you know, there's this old slogan, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, about data structures plus algorithms. I'm going to suggest that our new slogan needs to be data science plus data structures gives us what we call data centric computing. And in particular, that plus is not commutative in the, just like all good, you know, Python operators. Um, that plus is actually a directional, it's a temporal plus, meaning first you do the data science to get the students motivated and excited and set up. And then you migrate to data structures, which brings in the more traditional computer science, right? So that student who's, because we have this other problem now with computer science's popularity being what it is, which is a lot of students don't know if they really want to do computer science, right? They come into a CS1 class because they heard they should, their parents yelled at them and said, better sure, you better do, or they, they're not sure, they're tentative, they're a little nervous, right? And you want those students to feel invited. You want them to start off and doing something interesting and real, and then introduce them to the fabric of computer science. And at that point, they can decide, you know what? That data science stuff was awesome. I don't know what all this data structure tree graph nonsense is. I don't want to stick around. They can go off and take more data science courses, or they can say, wow, this stuff looks interesting. I should take some more of this as well, right? The difficulty we're starting to see is places are having these parallel tracks. And so you're asking an 18 year old to make a decision. 18 year olds can, can they can't, they can barely decide whether to wear socks on a given day. Okay. And you're asking them to make like weighty choices about disciplines and careers. And all they've got to do is to go on like some YouTube influencer video, which seems highly irresponsible on the part of universities. Right. So at least at Brown, the argument we've made is we want a unified introduction after students have had a chance to see things, then they can start branching out. You do not start out branching. And it's very hard to converge after you branch, right? You, you know, that student says, oh, you know what? Because there's another subject lurking in here. It's called data engineering, right? And data engineering is some data science and a lot of computer science. So that person who's done goes in the data science track and says, ooh, I'd like to learn more about databases. They show up in the database class and the database class says, okay, good. So you understand uh, relational algebra, you understand big O notation, you understand basic algorithms. They're like, I never saw any of those things before, 
because they were off on a data science track and then they can't even take the courses, right? So we create all these weird frictions and I'll, I'll tell you more about them later. But anyway, so this is why we're arguing that this is a better way to reformulate computer science. So it's actually of service to others while also being of service to itself. So this is our book, A Data-Centric Introduction to Computing. Um, for the Northeastern folks, this is, of course, your Ben Lerner. Um, and uh, I'm going to go very quickly through what's in the book. We start off actually with images uh, because they're a very fun data type to work with, but also the images do something profound. They tell us that just as information has structure, code has structure that compositionally matches the structure of the information. Right. So there's an interesting parallel between the structure and the datum and the structure and the code and gets you starting to think about this idea that the code and the data processes are somehow related. Right. We move from there right off to tables. So we want to compute and transform, summarize and so on. Sometimes we want to aggregate information across the data. That's how lists come into the picture. Sometimes we have structure within a datum. So for example, we start off with tables where dates are just written in some random string. And then you say, that's a pretty bad thing to process. What you really wish is you had a substructure where the date was broken down into three components or four components or whatever, so that you can write meaningful programs and not have to parse it over and over again and worry about invalid data, right? So it's sort of turning the HTTP philosophy on its back, right? Instead of saying, First, we start with data types, then we go to lists, then we go to tables. We start with tables, from tables we extract data types, and from tables we insert data, from tables we insert data types, from tables we extract lists, right? It's sort of backwards in order, really. We go from there to trees, as I just said, right? That's our point of departure from, from, um, from tables to trees. And then, of course, we get to things like graphs and whatever, right? It depends on what you want to do. Jacob, go ahead. Uh, so this, sorry to interrupt, this strikes me as a really fascinating philosophical difference from Matthias's talk, where he sort of described computer science as you add a concept, or at least the education, you add a concept, you see how far you can get with that, and then when you can't cover the surface, yep. you can add something else and it grows out. Is this yep. like the key difference you're talking about right here, where you're saying- I think it's a crucial <laughs> difference. I think it's a great, great observation. I think it's a crucial difference. I. I'm going to get back to how to design programs later on in this talk, okay? But I think there is something profound, in, profoundly intellectually deep about what Matthias is saying, right? So I don't disagree with him on that level. I think where our disagreement is, is on a pragmatic level of how do you construct curricula for different populations, right? And Matthias is super successful at what he does, or at least modestly successful at what we do. So, you know, I don't know. Right. But oh, yeah, yeah, I think that is the fundamental difference. That's right. Matthias is like, I'm going to take I'm going to take as little as possible. Right. What is the least amount of extra complexity I can add to the world and how far can I explore its consequences? Right. And he's a genius at that. Me not being as clever as them, I start with a lot of complexity and try to shrink it down instead. OK. Awesome. OK. Thank you. Sure. We go on to state. So notice, of course, unlike typical CS1, state shows really late, shows up really late in the curriculum. And I'm going to say more about this later. And then we get from state to hash tables where we talk about, you know, we want to improve the efficiency of dealing. It's it's a stateful operation that gives us certain. So so at state and hash tables is where like computational complexity starts to enter the curriculum, right? Because state is one motivation for state is computational complexity. Motivation for hash table is all about complexity, right? So at that point, you can start talking about what is an expensive versus a cheap computation, right? And there's a lot of cross-cutting themes here. There's all, by the way, the book itself has a bunch of other advanced topics. I'm trying to write like this book that is also for like, the, uh, there's a population, a large population out there of it, very engaged people who are professional programmers who never got a good CS education. And there's no good place for them to go. Right. So I'm also partly writing the book for them. There's all these concepts about representation, option types, and lazy programming and so on. So there are all these like little bonus materials sprinkled around the book that, you know, most people can skip, but for the people who really want to sink their teeth in deeper, it's in there. Okay. So um Socially responsible computing shows up in all of these places, right? Where we talk about representations and choices and what's included and who's included and how are they included and what's excluded and so on, 
right? Planning and composition start from very early on and then show up later on again in the curriculum. Um, notional machines, which are basically like user tested semantics, right? So how do what where do we need to explain the semantics of programming? Well, the critical places are tables and state. Those are the really hard, complicated things that, at which they can benefit from a semantics, right? So all of those things show up. I'm going to talk about state a little bit more later. And now we get to the critical thing that I promised I would talk about, like where what does all this have to do with, you know, where does GPT come in? Because a perfectly reasonable interpretation is all this is irrelevant because all this is going to be replaced by chat GPT generating code. So who cares? Okay. So I'm going to go back to this book, How to Design Programs, right? And this time uh, I'm, I'm going to take pot shots at it from a different angle. Right. So how to design program says you're going to break down programming into a sequence of steps. You define the data, you write examples of the data, you give a signature for the function, you write its purpose statement, you give examples of the function, you write a template, then fill in the body, and then finally you write tests. Okay. So what is what would be healthy for us as an exercise is to just go through all of these steps and confirm how many of these steps are being wiped out by ChatGPT. Right. I'm going to use chat GPT as an alias for GPT-4 or Copilot or pick whichever large language model automatically code generating thing you want. OK, so obviously nobody needs to write function bodies anymore. Right. These things will generate voluminous amounts of code. So let's start scratching out all the ones we don't need. And then, you know, we'll arrive at like what's actually necessary, because we could probably compress this book down to about 20 pages by, by the time we're done. Right. So um, writing tests. Actually, you probably should write tests. Right. It's not a bad idea. You don't want to trust the output from any of these machine generated things. OK, let's try to knock out uh, signatures. Actually, signatures are not a bad idea, because if you give a type, it significantly improves the quality of synthesis, program synthesis. So that we should probably keep. Um, okay, we can get rid of maybe examples. Actually, a bad idea because examples are also useful, especially for any inductive synthesis process. Examples are really useful for synthesis. Okay, um, maybe we can get rid of the template part. Actually, that's not a good idea because um, that's how we get to specify design choices. Like I might want to get shape the code generation in a particular direction for complexity reasons or readability reasons or something else. And that's a template-like thing. So probably we don't want to get rid of that either. OK, uh, we can certainly get rid of the data definition. Actually, maybe not, because data layouts are a very crucial thing to reason about. Data layouts embody all kinds of things. They embody knowledge about the world. They embody like social contracts. They embody complexity decisions, right? Like. How you organize your data has huge consequences for the big O complexity of your programs. Um, okay, that one's a tricky thing to get rid of. Examples of your data, well, that's a bad thing to do. We just said examples improve synthesis, probably shouldn't get rid of that. But the purpose statement, actually, you know what? The purpose statement, we have a whole new name for purpose statements. That's called prompt engineering. So actually, maybe there's really only one thing we can get rid of here. And what Matthias doesn't realize is he spent decades training people to be really good communicators with ChatGPT, right? So, okay. So uh, I wish he were here. I, was, I built this talk to provoke him and he doesn't even show up. Okay, anyway, so jokes aside. So I actually think what we can arrive at is a much richer kind of programming where again, Talking about CS1 being something that can speak to this much larger population of people coming from all across campus, whether they're learning computer science or data science or they're not sure, right? I think we should, we are teaching them really valuable things. If you follow a curriculum like HTTP, you're teaching them these really valuable things because all of these are skills that are designed for human to human communication and are also useful for human to computer communication. And we're still in the sort of like early days of like, oh, look at GPT. I can go type an English sentence and it, you know, basically it will match against some code that it picked up some code base with some amount of generativity in there. And we're all like superbly impressed by it. But I think in, you know, coming months and years, we'll realize that we have a much more nuanced story to tell. And you can basically take this as my prediction that this is what we're going to find. We're going to wish we had all of these things and we're going to be telling people to put all these things and we drop them all from our curriculum and we're going to put them back in our curriculum and we'll end up putting them back in because this is what it takes to good to do good programming and to do good synthesis. Right. So we'll end up in a much more interesting and nuanced place. OK, so I want to wrap up the talk because I want to have plenty of time for questions. Um, 
on this slide, I'm just going to flash a bunch of research paper titles at you. I'm not expecting you to see this, but what I want you to understand is that computing education is not just a matter of opinion, right? CS Ed has an awful lot of opinion in it, and I've certainly given you my share of opinion, but it's also a genuine research area, right? It's every bit as much of a research area as uh, programming languages or compilers or operating systems or machine learning or any of these other things are. We can ask rigorous questions. We can construct rigorous answers. We have a variety of methods. And the fact that we don't do enough of it is really a reflection on us, not on the subject. Okay. I'm going to give you a very concrete example of this. So I told you about the state chapter. Let me give you a few snippets from what's going on in the state chapter. So the book uh, uh, DCIC, Data Centric Introduction, starts in Pirate and then migrates to Python. Okay, it's a very conscious decision because Pirate has all kinds of things that make it really friendly for beginners. And then Python, of course, has all kinds of things that make it really friendly for industrial production use, right? So we start with something beginner friendly and then we migrate to something that is professional friendly. And state is a critical part where we start to make that transition one of the things that's really interesting in DCIC's coverage of state, which is not true of just about any other book I know, is we actually show all the programs in both languages. Okay. So, you know, for example, at the top, we've got, you know, Elena, we make an account and then we add something, we add, we, you know, add something to its balance. We show how to do it in Python and we showed how to do it in Pirate. And Pirate has an intentionally somewhat different syntax. And the book explains why the syntax is different. In Python, we can write an assertion. In Pirate, we can write a check. So also all of the testing libraries, we show how to convert the ideas about testing. And in fact, the state chapter talks a lot about how to test in the presence of state, which is something that most books never talk about, right? But we also, so these are basically showing you that the same ideas can, are this, these ideas are the same across languages to explain that there's some universality to them, right? You will see these ideas in several languages going forward, not just in these two. But then some things are a little different. So when you write a data type definition, for example, I mean, in Python, you call it the data class. In Pirate, you have an algebraic data type structure. But the key thing is in Pirate, things are immutable unless you say ref. Okay, and you can see that the ID is fixed, but the ref, the account, uh, the balance is changing, right? As you would kind of expect in a bank account. Now, of course, that's not a thing Python has, but that's a thing that a lot of modern languages do have. Right. So, I mean, it's already right there. You can see that Python is like, you know, an ancient language by the fact that it has mutability everywhere by default. Right. And if you go to Rust or anything else, this is you need to know how the, the pirate style of writing things, not the Python style of writing things. So now we can also talk about the differences and talk about some of the subtleties that they introduce. And then when you make an instance of this account in pirate, it actually prints out in a funny way. Right. So if you make this account, its account number is 8404 and you print it, it's got a balance of 500. Pirate will actually draw a little like yellow and black box um, and that yellow and black. So it's like it's like a police tape. Right. It's saying, you know, it's sort of like crime scene happened here. Right. So it's basically saying this value you have to watch out for, because the next time you look at ACCT1, you can be sure the 8404 will be the exact same, but the 500 might be different. In fact, in Pirate, if you change it, you can go to that 500 and click on it and it'll update and tell you the latest value, right? This is all like Ben Lerner's genius, right? So, so this is a case where Python did not think mutability was an important concept. It's just like, ah, yeah, mutability, great. Everything's mutable. Pirate actually wants you to understand this. This is one of the ways, you know, it's a pedagogic language, right? We're willing to pay the price to get these ideas right. And that's why we start out in Pirate and move to Python, right? So, Actually running these programs in both languages is very instructive because you'll see things in one language that you will gloss over in the other that are actually extremely important. So in fact, the chapter on state in the book is driven by a whole bunch of research that, you know, Kathy and I and others have been doing for the past five, six years. Um, we do the multi-language presentation because we want students to understand how these ideas cross over across languages. And that's the philosophy in the whole book. We want you to start, learn one language and then a second language so you understand how to transfer ideas. You see ideas a second time in a new syntax, but the same ideas so that they reinforce better. Second is we use some very interesting work from cognitive science to highlight the commonalities and differences because there's a lot of good literature that says that's how people actually learn. And in fact, learning in just one language is arguably less effective than seeing these things across them. 
Third is we have one of the most careful explanations of aliasing because we've done a lot of research over the years that shows that people really struggle with aliasing. In fact, uh, Kwang Chen, uh, my PhD student, and I have this online tutor now, and we're finding programmers from all over the world just don't understand aliasing, right? But if you don't understand aliasing, good luck understanding Rust, good luck understanding parallelism, understanding anything else, right? So I think it is unethical for intracurricula to teach students state and not explain aliasing properly, but that's what they do. That's something we're trying to not do. And finally, we present a notional machine so that students can actually understand these ideas through a semantic account so they can try to understand what's going on under the scenes, but not at the machine level, right? Finding the right intermediate balance. So, so that's why I showed you all these papers, right? The papers are papers, they're boring, who cares? It's just like academics being academics. The question is, what are the lessons we learn and how do they impact us? These are examples of the impact they have on the design of the book. So the idea is the entire book is meant to be a research-driven book rather than an opinion-driven book, okay? So that's the end of my talk. There's a book. Uh, it's online. It's at DCIC World. There's an article that Kathy and I wrote in CAC, uh, Communications of the ACM that lays out our argument about this data centricity as a curriculum design principle. And finally, there's the course that's at Brown, but of several other universities are starting to copy it or adapt it and so on. So this idea is now spreading to a bunch of other places. And needless to say, everything's free and online, and I'm happy to take questions. You're happy to chat with me, whatever. Okay. That's the end of my talk and now fire away. Sri Ram, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. I normally, we just kind of take an ad hoc approach to questions where people unmute and ask, but we have a lot okay. of people here today. So I think okay. it might be a good idea to use the uh, hand up uh, reaction thing. Um, and then maybe you can you can call on people. Um, but maybe I'll just start us with one. While you're doing that, I'm just gonna read the comments because I'm sorry, I didn't notice oh, yeah. there were chat. Ah, Actually, capitalization. In fact, we had a uh, we had a Belgian and a and a Dutch person in my department, both of whom had a van fun, right? Except one was a lowercase v and one was the uppercase v, and it's like uh, who's what? I don't know, right? So yeah, no, it's it's very much a thing, and yeah, tons of websites fix your name. Uh, hey Luna, uh, thanks for the talk so far. I hate to admit, uh, but uh, multiple e found that adding Python types don't improve GPD performance. Yeah, yeah, that'll change. That'll change. It'll all come to that census sooner or later. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also, I think Luna, I was using synthesis in a more general sense because I don't think we're going to, in the long term, only do language level, language model based synthesis, but also other kinds of synthesis, you know, like type driven synthesis, et cetera. I suspect that in about five years, we'll have much richer tools that integrate all these other forms and talk to each other much more. So, but yeah, for now, I agree. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Luna. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Max, fire away. Yeah. Uh, okay, so so people can ask questions by clicking reaction and clicking raise hand. And I guess Sriram, you can call on them. And uh, yep. just to get us started, I was wondering if you could comment on the pedagogical power of visualization, um, because I, I didn't really come up in the talk that much, but I find I learn things easier when I visualize <laughs> the data. And But visualization could be frustrating for like intro programmers who don't necessarily know how to use visualization tools. So what, what do you think is the pedagogical benefit of, of visualizing data? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I, so, okay. So, so now I will be explicit when I'm stating opinions rather than research driven facts. Um, this is me stating an opinion here, which is that, um, I've never been a big fan of visualizations, mostly because they look pretty and I don't know what they mean. Um, this is actually a fairly well understood phenomenon about visual presentations, which is that visual visual presentations have the benefit of being extremely obvious. They have the small disadvantage that they mean different things to different people. They're completely obvious to everyone. They just mean different things. And it takes a long time before you start to like go into the conversation and say, wait, what do you mean? It's like, well, because this means that. You're like, wait, this means that. I thought this meant that. And then you realize your entire conversation has been sort of incomprehensible all along, right? So, so I'm not a fan of that. There's been a lot of work on algorithm visualization, for example. Um, it was like a major subject. In fact, Brown University was like a center of producing algorithm visualizations. And it quietly died and went away, partly because I think people produced lots of pretty pictures, had fun building graphics, and students didn't get a whole lot of use out of them, right? When you actually study the measured effects, they were quite small. So 
visualization is a big thing, right? There's data visualization, algorithm visualization, et cetera. There's also, of course, the kind of visualization that's like statistics, right? Like I, I do statistics and I want to generate a plot. I think the latter is obvious, right? There's an entire community that's built around it. There's entire books and curricula. There's, you know, ggplot and Edward Tufte and so on. So we know a lot about how to do it right and how to do it poorly. And if you do it well, it's really good, right? So that part I find pretty indisputable as a way of making large scale sense out of... Uh, small sense out of large data, if you will, right? That's one way to think about visualization. It's a kind of compression technique. And and of course, you know, the usual argument is, well, you know, the visual cortex is the largest part of our brain and therefore, and, and I, there's obviously truth to all of those arguments. So I think when you're using the visual cortex to make sense out of something large, that makes sense. Visualization of programs and execution, eh, kind of limited. Um, there's a separate project that uh, my postdoc, Will Crichton, and I are running on Rust uh, education. By the way, if anyone's a fan of Rust, anyone's interested in Rust and has struggled to understand ownership, we are, Max, using visualization to help. Um, and we built two visualizations, one of the static system and one of the dynamic system. I think it works pretty well for small programs. A usual problem, of course, any visualization system is when programs get large, like does it make any sense at all? Does it just get overwhelming, right? But since there we're specifically trying to get people to understand small programs to understand uh, ownership, I think it makes some sense over there. Um, so I think that's a very, very, very long answer to say, I don't, we have not done a lot of the program visualization stuff. It seems unlikely because I have not found it that compelling. Um, there is some amount of visualization that goes on in understanding like heap models and stuff like that, that I'm interested in. Like, I think a place where visualization is really valuable, understanding aliasing. Because on this, what is aliasing at the end of the day? Roughly speaking, aliasing is two different things point to the same thing, right? If I can just draw you a damn arrow and show you the thing pointing, you'll understand it. And if I don't, no amount of talking is going to make sense, right? But even there, uh, so my PhD student, Kuang Chen, is also building a program uh, stacker, a stepper, which is a visualization engine. And drawing arrows has advantages, okay? But it also has disadvantages because people, students have this tendency to say, like, there are no arrows inside the computer. I know how computers work. They don't have arrows, right? So we've also been experimenting with using, like, fake addresses at 1001, at 1002, and, like, color coding as a way of showing similarity of addresses. And that has the advantage that it feels a little bit more authentic, right? as an explanation of what the computer is doing. And you cannot discount authenticity because if you if students feel something is inauthentic, they'll be like, nah, that's not what's really going on. They'll just ignore your explanations. So that's the other thing. It's very subtle to get these kinds of things right, but that's an active topic we're studying. Okay, so there's my like extremely long answer to a very innocent question. Um, so Jacob, before you, uh, Ankit has a question. Does Pirate induce functional programming? Absolutely, Pirate is functional, man. We're like OCaml. We're OCaml, we're Racket. Our our genes are taken from OCaml and Racket, which are the true languages, and uh, you know, uh, clothed in a gentle syntax for everybody's benefit. But it's with state. We have honest to goodness state. We have honest to goodness functional programming. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jacob, go ahead. Okay. So um, one question. So a premise first, which you can feel free to disagree with. Ah, is great. That, um, it seems to me like. With computer science education, there is this notion of who is it for? And it's oh, yeah. like education is set up in a certain way that targets a certain audience. For example, I think this audience probably skews to do well with the Matthias type, lots of mathematicians and grad students who want to really delve deep into yep. niches. Yep. And that you've taken the approach of, well, computer science should be more for, for other people too. So you have another approach that is supposedly more amenable to that. So I'm curious, yep. in your classes with this new methodology, who has it been for that has surprised you? Like, who has this done well for that, for example, is not the typical person in this audience today who would do well with the Matthias approach? Well, so you asked actually two questions there, right? In one, you, you had an and, which is who has it done well that surprised you? And I think the answer is we have not been surprised because we've gotten exactly what we expected, which is a much more diverse student population. Right. So uh, we in Kath, in particular, I should be careful. You said your class, but I should really say Kathy's class because that CS111, which is our new introductory sequence at Brown, is Kathy's the one running it. Um, so I want to just be clear that I, I don't get any credit for this, but uh, the diversity of that class is really great. 
Uh, we're seeing the kinds of diverse populations that the other intro CS classes are not seeing quite the same way. Um, even though it's a brand new class, doesn't have like some campus legend teaching it or something like that. Uh, and we're seeing much more engagement from, uh, uh, yeah, generally there's no math prereq and that's really important. Really, really important, right? There is absolutely no math prerequisite. We only want students to understand like what an average is. By the way, there's something I discovered. In 2003, I started to invent a class on Intro to Computing for Humanities and Social Science. It was explicitly called that. That was the title. Um, I had this anticipation that social studies was going to be revolutionized by data. I didn't know why, but it felt like something like MySpace might make a change to the way sociology is studied. And then three years later, Facebook came along and you know, big data came along, and that turned out to be true. Um, and when I designed that class, it was very... Uh, First month was all in spreadsheets, right? Because that's the one programming medium students knew coming in, right? Or were comfortable learning and didn't mind learning and felt it was value to learning, right? If you gave them any other programming language, they'd be like, why do I need to know this? Like, is this going to be of use to me? R, Python, whatever. But with spreadsheets, like nobody disputes the value. And this goes back to Jan Lee's question, which is, Students asked, well, what is the math prereq, right? And, and what are the prereqs? And the answer was like, no, there are no prereqs. And we said that, what I discovered is students literally did not believe us because these were students who were already, I mean, you have to understand this is like 2005, right? They were already nervous about CS. They already had this vision that CS was this like nerd geek heaven and they didn't belong. That was their feeling. And so if you said there's no prereq, they're like, obviously you're lying. So I'm just not going to trust anything you say from now on. I'm not going to take the class. What I discovered was it's very important to give them a prereq. So what I said is you really, really have to be able to sum up a column of numbers in Excel. Otherwise, this class is just not going to work for you. Guess what? Everybody knows how to sum up a column of numbers in Excel. But the moment you give them a prereq and you say it very seriously, they're like, oh, there is. Oh, wait, but I know how to do that. Completely change the conversation. Right. So depending on your student population, you have to tell not a lie. You should never lie, but you should tell like a gentle version of the truth. And in our case, also, when students ask, we say, like, look, you've got to be able to compute like an average of numbers. Right. That's the prereq, but it's not no formal math course prereq or anything. And generally, a lot of students who take these courses are taking it first semester college. Um, and Brown does not have like a it's not like MIT, right? Like everyone has calculus coming in or anything like that, right? And we are a liberal arts place and we have a lot of students who've had minimal, you know, basic math in high school. So so there is very little math prereq and we don't use a lot of math. I hope that answers your question. Awesome. Yeah, um, so, so I'm back to J Jacob now. I'm going to pop the stack and go back to finishing up my answer to Jacob. So there are no surprises, but it is diversifying. And I think, I think this is in general, I, I don't want to set this apart as I really don't want to turn this into me versus Matthias. Um, but my philosophy has definitely been, even in the way I teach programming languages, right? Uh, or the way we designed this really cool formal methods course at Brown that you might want to hear about at some point. My philosophy is I want to target what I call the other 90% which is if I teach a course, there's 10% of the class that is just like me, but there's the other 90% that are not being served by me. And I wanna do everything I can to serve them. Uh, like with my PL class, right? Um, there's 10% who are like the people on this call. Okay, exactly like the people on this call. And you know what? They'll go read like Harper's book on their own, right? They'll go read Pierce's book on their own. They don't need me to teach it. I, there's nothing I can possibly do to harm them. There's nothing I need to do to teach them. They'll figure this stuff out. And if not, they'll go to grad school someday and figure this stuff out, right? What I want to do is to turn the other 90%, I want to turn at least 50 to 60% of that other 90% into people who believe that there's value in learning this subject. And if I go in and say day one, you know, diamond lemma, day two, subject reduction, I will not get them. I have to figure out how to get them in both PL and informal methods. That is my goal. And it's very different from other people's goals, right? And these are complementary goals. Um, and, you know, my PL class, for example, has produced a whole bunch of like who's who's right now in CS. I'm not going to take credit for them. I'm just going to say that it's evidence that I didn't do too much harm, right? But I really think we have to be thinking about all of our courses from this, like, you know, the 1%, the 10%, the 90% or whatever, pick whichever metaphor you want or 80% or something and really think consciously about how to engage them and how to preserve, retain them and get them far enough that they maybe become, start to see our way of the world too, right? Like, I, I think it's also dangerous to somehow think of them as not mathematical, not capable or whatever, right? Like, it's depressing even to like think of educating people who you think are not capable. Of course they're capable, right? It's just that they have a different value system. 
right? I, I had this experience too, like in my PL class, I was all about like, I want to teach the hardcore PL people. And then I realized I had all these advisees who were like, you know, they came to me as advisees because I like hardcore into PL, formal methods, whatever. And I tell them, you should go take a machine learning course. They'd be like, okay. I, I mean, this was, you know, five, seven years ago now. I don't need to tell them that. But they'd be like, oh, okay, that's fine. But their heart wasn't in it. And at some point I realized, you know, there may be students in my class who really their hearts in machine learning and not in PL. And what's my duty to them? Is my duty to them like, is, it like, is my attitude going to be like, well, you know, you don't care about my subject. Why should I care about you? Or they're just like those students who are like PL students who should take a little ML. It's like, yeah, you should get an honest introduction to my subject. And it's up to you. If you don't want to, if, if it's not what you get up in the morning for, that's actually okay. And I made peace with that, and it changed the way I thought about education. Cheng. Hi. Uh, so it's a, it's a great talk. Thank you for, I think it's a very eye-opening and, uh, you know, a lot of what you think. Uh, but I have a, a, a question that was kind of similar uh, to Luna. Uh, I'm, I'm not a synthesis <laughs> person, and I don't really know how machine learning works. So the yep. entire question might be extremely stupid. Uh, but uh, I talked to uh, uh, synthesis people before. Uh, and I, I was very surprised that um, he says that uh, the GitHub Copilot person uh, was trying to avoid like all the PL technique, like yeah. you actually parse everything into a syntax tree and do uh, generate machine learning model on the syntax tree. Uh, yeah, but yeah. a lot of them, what they do actually, it's just they, they just generate machine learning model on the text. Yeah. I think like as PL people for us, it's obvious that uh, we think like things are easier in uh, abstract syntax tree and uh, things are easier when they have a semantics, things are easier when we give them a type, some type informations and yeah. uh, then they can generate things uh, better. Do you feel like maybe we, obviously I'm with you, but do you feel like maybe we kind of have this kind of bias that um, kind of more structured things that we don't understand well can build better machine learning model, uh, or maybe in the future that nobody... These are great questions. Um, before I uh, give you a BS answer, I'm going to let you know I'm BSing you because I don't know any more than you do. Okay. Um, I Here's the thing. There is no question that these but these non-PL methods, let's call them in this setting, have been amazingly powerful, way more powerful than anyone expected or anticipated, and are only getting better, right? Um, in fact, like, you know, Arjun Guha, who is a professor now at Northeastern, who was my former student, is like one of the people who's leading the charge on this, right? So there's no question about that. The The thing is, I, you know, I think if you think in the, in the span of uh, these tools, right? I think we're kind of at like the first second or second second in the span of history, basically, right? It's amazing and it's life-changing and game-changing and everything else. But also, you know, there's this weird thing that happens where you play with these tools for a little while and you start to realize they produce pretty crappy output as well, right? So here's an example that I, I did recently. I, I said, okay, let me pretend I can use it as a SAT solver. Right, so I'm going to feed it constraint programming problems, and I, 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 I thought I was being quite careful in how I designed the problem, so it's unlikely to be in the training set. Like I, you know, I, I set it up in a way that seemed unlikely that it could have pre-trained very much on it. So I fed it some SAT-solving problems, and I asked it to come up with satisfiable instances and explanations, and it gave me beautiful answers. It was perfectly right. It gave me the answer and explained the answer. Right, it, these were problems that were complicated enough. It took me five minutes to check the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. I tweaked the problem, fed it again. It gave me an answer. It took me five minutes. And it was right. And I gave it a third problem where the problem was unsatisfiable. And it gave me an answer and a justification for why that was the satisfying answer. I'm like, what the fuck, right? So, so, so there's something stranger than I can than I can possibly comprehend going on here that is able to produce actually good explanations and actually BS explanations for very similar phenomena. Right. So, I mean, hallucination, whatever. Right. We all know, you know, anybody who's on Twitter enough spends too much time reading this stuff anyway. OK, so the question is, is this how it's going to be forever? Right. 
Is Copilot absurdly uh, effective? Yes, it is. But it's absurdly effective at a kind of thing that is very useful, but not wholly interesting, right? A lot of these like API fills, like just this afternoon, I was actually just before this call, I was like, okay, I need to do a plot, right? So I had some, uh, some function and I wanted to plot it. And I'm like, oh God, I can never remember the names of these plotting libraries and which import statement and how do I call it and whatnot. Like, this is a job for Copilot because a million people have written it and I don't want to be, I don't, and I've written it 10 times, I don't want to remember any of it, right? But when it comes to synthesizing truly interesting code, they do all kinds of wonderfully bizarre and incorrect things, right? So you have to decide, are we impressed or are we not impressed? Okay. Well, of course, it's impressive at some level, but we we are all, we all agree that we can't stop here, right? Mm -hmm. There's no way we can stop here. But what are the next methods? And I am very interested by this idea. You know, in in the world of SAT, SAT, right? We made this massive improvement when we got to, from SAT to SMT, right? Satisfiability modulo theories, because it didn't make sense to take every problem in the world and think of it as a SAT problem when we had great decidability theories for all sorts of interesting mathematical and other questions, right? Yeah. It's pretty obvious to me that we're going to eventually end up in some sort of LLM modulo theory space. We have to right? Because there are all kinds of questions for which we have ground truth, we have perfect answers, we have solvers that are fast, correct, and everything. Why would we want to use like a language model to muck around with that? That makes no sense in the world, right? And people are talking already about, um, yeah, yeah, I don't entirely know how the plugins work. I don't know what the interface is. Like, does it even know when to go to a plugin, right? Because part of the whole problem is how do you know even know when to go to a plugin, right? Do you know the right situations to use the plugin? That is sort of the whole problem here. Right. I don't know anything about this. I'm talking to people who know a lot more. I'm trying to understand more. But that is where we're going to start making like ma massive leaps. Right. Because we'll get all of the stuff that people have already done, like S SAT, SMT and solvers and mathematical solvers and linear optimization and all of that land. Right. And combined with this. In fact, you can already see this right now. You know how? Take a math problem and feed it to whichever language model you want. Like I've got a I've got a paid account for GPT-4. Take whatever account you want. Okay. Take the same question and feed it into Wolfram Alpha. Mm. Literally the same text. Okay. Wolfram Alpha will do a good enough job with your text and it has actual math underneath. Right. You give it a function, it'll give you five different representations, it'll give you a graph, it'll give you a this, it'll give you a that, it'll show you saddle points and everything else. And they are all correct. Correct. No question asked, they are correct, right? It actually knows mathematics. So the real power is going to be when we can combine these things, right? The the natural language parsing ability to make sense out of what we're trying to say, and then going off to all these individual solvers. So five years, so has type-driven synthesis actually succeeded? No. And you know what? I've been seeing type-driven synthesis papers since like 1980. OK, and they've gone from like, I don't know, three line programs, to, I don't know, maybe six line programs or something like that. Right. On its own, not very effective. Right. Mm -hmm. On its own is like, you know, something else driven synthesis, like, you know, uh, the, the, the PL synthesis stuff. I think it's pretty limited. Right. And uh, I, I don't think it's that effective. But then, you know, people talk about neurosymbolic programming. You know, you have people like Swarath who understand both sides of the story. I think they're going to do something powerful. The NLP people are going to hit their limits. They're going to need solvers. And we're going to see this massive improvement where all of the NLP stuff, all of the math solving stuff, all of the like the Wolfram Alpha stuff, all of the SMT modulo theory things, all of those are going to come together. You'll have sort of like language on the outside, theory on the inside. And that's when we're going to get to like actually reliable, trustworthy quality output, mm -hmm. right? So is Copilot finding it useful today? No, but I think five, we. I want to know what's going to happen five years from now. I can't even begin to imagine what's going to happen five years from now, mm. right? But one of the interesting questions is also how do we incorporate these into our courses, right? Where does this play into courses? And that's the sort of stuff I've been thinking about with the current technology. Five years from now, it may be something completely different. Okay, uh, Ryan, go ahead. And I'm sorry to interrupt. So thank you for patiently waiting, Ryan. Uh, unless anyone else has any burning questions, this will probably be our last one. We usually keep it to about an hour, and Max has yep, to. Yep, uh, yep, yep. Sounds good. Time Sounds good. So and thanks, go. thanks, Max. Sorry, sorry, you need to leave, but thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, bye. Ryan, hey, go uh, ahead. If you want to type it in, that's fine too. Whatever works for you. Oh, I was I was interested enough to join twice. <laughs> the laptop is charged. Um, 
Uh, so I'm going to ask a, a, a you versus Matias question, kind of. Um, so when I was listening to your uh, your discussion of the DCIC curriculum, um, it sounded okay. So first, let me let me kind of caricature how to design programs as you know you deliver a bunch of principles at the beginning and say here are the rules. And then over the course of the uh, of the semester, hopefully you reinforce those and students say, oh yeah, I see why this is a good idea. Uh, but that the rules that you get in the beginning are kind of the, the foundation of the course. They're the skeleton. They're like, how do I know whether I'm on track, uh, et cetera. It sounds like what you're doing instead is, you know, you're presenting the motivation and then kind of doing induction yes. to probably yes. wind up with the principles. And so my question, I, so I have a couple of questions, but uh, basically, do you get the same strength and, and clarity of principles at the end that students can kind of rely on and take throughout the rest of the, uh, of the, the CS curriculum or the data science curriculum? Mm -hmm. uh, and are the principles that you wind up with different um, than, say, how to design programs? Are they different for the CS track versus the the data science track uh kind of invitation to 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 talk about uh what you've discovered about that yeah sounds great that's a great question you of course correctly intuited that we're looking at things much more inductively uh we're making the machine human learners follow machine learning principles because that is how humans learn humans learn mostly bottom up they learn from examples they induce um and we, if you let them in, people will induce whether you ask them to or not, right? This is a well-known thing. If you give people a set of dots there, if you give them a cloud, they'll see an animal in it, right? If you give them a set of dots, they'll find a pattern in it. People will induce patterns even where they don't exist. So if you let them induce, but you also constantly keep reshaping the induction that they're going through to say, but this is the principle we want you to learn. This is the principle we want you to learn. We're going to give you the abstraction now. Then you can shape that they are inducing in the right way rather than, hallucinating, so to speak, right, to use today's terminology, okay? So we're definitely doing that, and we're doing induction sort of by need theory, if you will. Okay, now the question, the second question you asked was this very provocative question, like how do you know that they really learned it, they, they, and you know, that they, they understand how to apply it, and they take it with them through the rest of the curriculum? I'm going to turn that question completely around at you and ask, how do you know that your students in HTTP learned it? And how do you know that they applied it anywhere else in the curriculum? What evidence do you have for any of that beyond the two students who came to you and told you how much they liked it? Yep, fair question. Yeah. And until I see that evidence, I, do I, don't, I don't feel like answering the question. Okay. Uh, I do have one other question to push onto the queue. That I I, by the way, I want to make clear, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, right? I, I think yeah. what we're missing is that research basis. This goes back to the slide with all the papers, right? We don't have yeah. a research basis that lets us conclude one way or the other. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm saying we don't know one way or another. And part of the reason it matters is you have to apply the right research methods to understand how it is happening, right? What lesson did they carry away? How did they learn it? For example, it is conceivable that they think, oh yeah, design recipe, great idea. It's a great method for learning scheme, okay? And you'll be like, I don't teach scheme. I don't even teach racket. I teach star SL and this is a universal principle, but that doesn't mean they understood it and that doesn't mean they believe it and that doesn't mean they can apply it, right? It takes an extraordinarily powerful thinker to, to learn the design recipe, for example, in racket and apply it in Java or JavaScript right? That is a transfer learning problem, which is one of the hardest problems we have in education. So saying that they can do it because I can do it doesn't mean very much. And when you try to do it and you try to study it, that's when you'll find out what works and what doesn't. And so my argument is, until we do that research, we can't even meaningfully have this conversation. So my, my follow-up... Uh, and follow-up, and I think good. last, because uh, I think we've been warned that we need to be shutting down. So let's call it the last uh, yeah, question. Sorry. Uh, how how teachable is this approach to other educators? That's a good uh, question. I don't know. You know, the problem, the, the problem uh, is I think the principles are very teachable. 
the uh, the where this always runs afoul is like people, you know, the most unproductive conversation in every CS education discussion is what programming language do you use? And, um, you know, we had to make a conscious decision. We felt we could make millions if we wrote the book in Java, in Python entirely. Uh, I was not interested in making millions. So we've consciously decided to start in Pirate and migrate to Python. And that greatly reduces the number of people who'd be willing to use it and therefore probably even willing to read it. That's too bad. Right. Uh, it sucks for us, but probably sucks for other people, too. Uh, we have very good reasons for doing what we do and we justify our reasons and we still end up in Python by the end of the semester because that is a useful goal. Right. You have to set the right interface boundary. And I think the end of the semester is a good interface boundary. That's still there's still going to be a lot of people who won't buy the lesson because they think Python's language is sure. Therefore, on day one, you have to program in Python. Um, you know, that's that's fine. And uh, we as I said, but I'm not going to be able to retire off the book as a result. But on that very positive and optimistic note, I think we have to stop. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. I even more appreciate the fact that some of you have hung around for an hour and 17 minutes. Uh, I apologize for keeping you this long, but, uh, you know, curriculum conversations are fun. But thank, thank you, everybody. This has been no. really great, and I appreciate you inviting me to this. True. Thank you. This was a fantastic talk. We all really appreciated it. I'm sorry we didn't get to accomplish your goal of provoking Matthias, but we'll be sure to send him the link to the video. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye. Okay,